publicly. So the first time was for the Communication Scholars Network that Robert Woods put together and asked me if I would do it. And I said, sure. And what I said to them that night was, uh, if you find this really helpful, great. If you didn't, it was free. So <laughs> that's what I'll say to you as well. Um, I feel the same pressure you do at Biola. Biola is crazy. It's my 10th year here, and you feel like you get caught into a riptide of committee work, advising. Our major is huge, like 290 majors. So academic advising, um, teaching load, uh, different committees. Uh, there just isn't time to write. Or there isn't mental energy to write. And I think both of those are really important. Since I've been here, I have been able to write. I, I, in the 10 years I've been here, I've been able to uh, write four, book, uh, four books, and I'm working on one right now. All of them are with uh, InterVarsity Press. I know nobody else but InterVarsity. And let me make one quick comment that we'll re revisit. Uh, authentic communication is in their academic press, and the rest are popular, and the only way that InterVarsity will distinguish between the two, if you feel like your book can have a life outside the classroom, their preference is that you would do it in their popular press. When you put InterVarsity Academic on the binding, they feel like it really pushes people away from the book. And I have found that to be true, um, is that uh, authentic communication really does just drive people away when they see uh, InterVarsity Academic. So again, they would probably prefer that you write for their uh, popular press. Because again, you can adopt that for the classroom, there's no problem. Uh, before we get to writing techniques and writing strategies on how to organize, edit, we have to deal with self-talk. Uh, for me, uh, as I interact with people, self-talk is what really shuts people down when it comes to writing. Um, from a communication standpoint, self-talk isn't part of who you are, it's all of who you are. And uh, people have made a lot of money when sports psychologists and trying to get people to believe in themselves. So if I say publishing a book seems, what would you say? How would you fill in the blank? What would go in that blank? Hard. Hard? Daunting. Overwhelming. Daunting. Overwhelming. Impossible. Impossible. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And that's exactly what I get from different individuals. Being published would make me feel what? Like a real This is asking for a lot of time. By the way, when I originally did this, it was me speaking into a microphone, and I never got audience reaction to the question. So I just realized this is kind of intimate kind of stuff. Yeah, being published will make me feel validated. Uh, it will make me feel like a real professor. Um, let me just stop and say very quickly, if your self-talk is at that stage, I don't think you'll, you'll do much writing. <laughs> if it feels impossible, then I, I think it will always appear daunting. And if everything's writing on this book, a feeling of validation, then it becomes too much. Uh, Lord Byron once said, all is to be feared when all is to be lost. So if everything is writing on me being published, man, that's, I, I, if i got to make this fall shot to win the game, I'm going to be a basket case. Um, by the way, even getting published, it, it puts you in a different category of insecurity and criticism. Um, my book, uh, um, I Beg to Differ, was reviewed by Books and Culture, which is awesome. I mean, InterVarsity was thrilled. And 80% of it was positive, and 20% was negative. And I stewed on the 20%. I was like, that's just... Uh, my books have not won awards. Which, which when you publish, InterVarsity can nominate you for awards, and they have not nominated me for any award, like with Christianity Today and uh, their awards. So it opens you up for more criticism in, in an interesting kind of way. Uh, the popular press is all about book sales. Uh, there's a certain threshold for book sales that they want to see. Academic, it's different. It's a totally different game. So just know that if your self-talk isn't strong before publishing, it, it will take a hard hit once you publish. Um, it, it does validate you for a half hour. And then you're constantly checking Amazon book rankings. You know I, mean? <laughs> I, I think in order for us to write, you have to tune out the faculty, the phantom faculty member. Here's what I do at Biola University. I have a phantom perfect faculty member. And it's really not one person. It's the passion of Eric Tonitz. It's um, Ken Birdie and his wife have this policy 
that you can call them 24 hours notice and pop in for dinner. Okay, so I have those two. I have the uh, discipleship of a John Lundy who, who meets with students all the time. And that's who I'm competing against, a person who doesn't really exist. So I'm going to have to fight against the phantom uh, faculty member if I'm going to actually be selfish enough to carve out consistent writing time. So I, I, I think some of you, your, your um, teaching evaluations are, I, I can't believe I'm saying this in front of a dean, I think some of you, your teaching evaluations are too high and need to come down a little because it's killing you to get there. Again, when I fill out an annual report, it asks me three questions, not one. It asks me about my teaching. It asks me about service to the community, which is committee work and speaking in chapel and things like that. The third one is your research. What I have found at Biola, talking to fellow faculty, is the research is the one that they never get to because the other two are out of balance. So I think Biola would want us to be a balanced faculty member, and that means for some of us, those teaching evaluations need to come down a little bit um, because you want to be holistic. And that's hard, to, that's hard to do when students are always at your door, always want time. I teach relationships class. So it's like my wife and I are, the, are uh, Dr. Phil. You know, I mean, people want to talk about relationships all the time, and I will never get to writing if, if I don't put borders in certain places. The biggest thing I want to talk about when we actually get to writing is we have to learn to turn off the judge. This comes from Roger Van Eck, who studies creativity. He says that all of us have a warrior and all of us have a judge. The warrior is the wildly, spontaneous, creative side. The judge jumps in and judges very quickly and harshly. Van Eck would say the key to creativity is you have to have room to let the warrior just run free. But all of us have been trained in academia. Hey, hey come on in. Marla. Uh, all of us have been trained in academia, so we're trained to be the judge. We are trained to be critical, and that, to me, is death when it comes to writing. The judge is over-emphasized um, in writing, and we need to learn to silence the judge. And I'll show you some uh, writing uh, exercises that help turn the judge off and allow the warrior to, to be productive. I've read some books on writing, not a ton. Let me give you my worst quote on writing I've ever read. I don't know who Gabriel Marquez is, but um, to me, this is death. I have spent many months on a first pa paragraph, and once I get it, the rest just comes out very easily. In the first paragraph, you solve most of the problems with your book. The theme is defined, the style, the tone. At least in my case, the first paragraph is a kind of sample of what the rest of the book is going to be. I couldn't disagree with that more. You will never write a book if the first paragraph carries all that weight. I actually advocate the total opposite, is just write. Just have fun. Never engage spell check. Just go. <laughs> um, and don't put all that kind of pressure on the first paragraph. That's so far down the line editing that it'll kind of choke out the, uh, the creativity of it. What I'm saying I'm applying to a book that equally applies to journal articles or any kind of writing, what we're going to eventually get to. Let me recommend this book to you, the single best book I've ever read on writing. It's by Paul Silva. Uh, it's called How to Write a Lot. Um, it is for academic writing, and he advocates a writing schedule that I've adopted, and I think that's one of the reasons I can produce. But he says this, the goal of text generation is to throw confused, wide-eyed words on a page. The goal of text revision is to scrub the words clean, so that they sound nice and make sense. Some writers, invariably struggling writers, try to write a pristine first draft, one free of flaws. And we need to get rid of that attitude of a pristine first draft. Uh, uh, Self-talk, chronic doubt, or lack of confidence. Because we're at a Christian institution, I think it would be highly unbiblical for us not to think that Satan would want to disrupt any part of our academic lives, which would be students teaching or writing. Uh, some of us, if we have chronic doubt or chronic uh, lack of confidence, I would want to check at least the spiritual aspect of that. That you may be under attack uh, from Satan wanting to get your thoughts on paper. I love this verse in Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. In Hebrew, the word crafty means subtle. So Satan isn't directly attacking you. He's subtly trying to undermine your confidence. 
And again, I've met writers and speakers where I've listened to them and, and thought they did a great job, chapel talk, and afterwards say to them, hey, great job. And they're just like, no, no, it's just, it's just wasn't good. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what did you listen to? And it's like, no, it just wasn't, I just, yeah, it could have been so much better. Okay, stop, wow. You have to learn to take a compliment. And you have to learn for somebody to look at your work and assess it. And, and, and take the good with the bad, but you've got to be able to hear the good. So know that no doubt Satan is part of this process. And if you're in a writing project, you might want to talk about spiritual means of addressing this. Um, learning to let the hands go. I, I've actually temporarily lost my mind. I became a Christian through karate, through martial arts. That's how I, how I became a believer. Uh, I became a believer through Michael Crane's Karate for Christ. I love that jujitsu for Jesus. I just love that. So I've temporarily lost my mind, uh, and I'm going back to my black belt in Shaolin Kung Fu. And when you spar, uh, the instructor's always saying, again, you're sparring a black belt. So you know you're walking to your own death, right? You're just walking into this, and it's going to be not good. He will yell to us, let your hands go. Don't just be, if I throw this punch, what's he going to do? No, let him go. React. And I think in writing, we want to get to the point where we just let our hands go. We turn off the judge and we just produce. Um, so before I start my writing project, here is what I do to get in the mindset of writing, and then I'm in my writing schedule. Uh, I write daily. Uh, every single day, I let my hands go. So I, I said this at the seminar. Begin, beginning tonight, write about current events, uh, spiritual issues or daily events. The Oscars just happened, ISIS. Um, the whole um, Brian Williams controversy, and now it's bled out to Bill O'Reilly. Uh, write as if an outside reader would read your entry. Think of it, I think that is an unpublished blog. Absolutely no editing. Not even stopping for a day spell check. I do this 15 minutes a day. I never miss it. So I sit down, open up, and I go, okay, um, Brian Williams. Oh my goodness, right? Um, 20 years of service, and it's all been put away because of uh, being careless with facts. And now, this is, and I just keep going. I don't stop for anything. I'm just writing. Uh, and then I finish it, and I don't even necessarily read it. I'm, just, I'm done for the day. Next day, 15 minutes, and I let my hands go, and I just write about what I, I'm kind of priming the pump to eventually write. Um, Practice turning off the judge. Freud postulated that each of us has internal sensors, which he called watchers at the gate. So if you're writing and you're immediately judging, thinking this isn't any good, or I'm going to stop, I'm going to go back, and I don't like that opening to my unpublished blog. No, stop. Just go and have fun and be creative. Yogi Berra said this, you can't think and hit at the same time. And I would say you can't write and think at the same You can't be critical and write at the same time or you'll finish with maybe one paragraph finished or a couple sentences. Uh, the key thing for me is I need to learn to write while not inspired. Uh, as Keyes put it, serious writers write, inspired or not. Over time, they discover that routine is a better friend to them than inspiration. Um, so this is all from How to Write a Lot. I bet you the book is 95 pages long really small, but it's worth its weight in gold. So I sit down, when I have a writing schedule, I write whether I want to or not. It's something I have worked into my week. And I write no matter what. Uh, and let my hands go as much as possible. Now most of us operate under the uh, binge writing method, which is when I finally get that seventh semester writing lead, when I finally get that mythical sabbatical, or finally summer comes. And the problem with this mentality is you give yourself a break all year because summer's coming, right? And so I'm fine. I know I'm not doing anything right now. I'm kind of you know, looking at some stuff, but oh, when summer comes, right? So January, uh, June 1st comes, and you sit down, and now all the weight of the world is on you. And now you're like, oh, oh, I don't have time to be creative. I've got to produce because I'm looking at a deadline, and I've waste, not wasted a year, but I've said, oh, and man, you just, I couldn't operate under that kind of pressure. That I couldn't be creative. Um, I like to use the classroom to package thoughts. Um, if possible, teach a special seminar on a writing topic. Uh, the book, The God Conversation, was actually a high-level 
COM 474 uh, seminar for seniors on communication, illustrations, and evangelism. Uh, that's a perfect scenario for me is allow me to teach on what I'm currently researching on. And I would advocate that the students benefit when we're passionate. When they're getting fresh stuff from us, I think they really feed off of that. Instead of me doing my research methods the 80th time, it's like, oh. But let me have a special seminar where I can talk about things that I'm really in the midst of. I think students pick up on it. I think they love it. Um, so, if I can teach a special seminar, that's the perfect world. If not, I incorporate into the syllabus topics that fit my writing project. So currently, my book is with Rick Langer. It's on being a Christian counterpublic. A counterpublic is when you're the minority perspective and you're arguing against the dominant perspective as a group, as a community. So, in my rhetoric class, I literally will stick in two lectures. I don't have any idea what these lectures are going to be yet but I stick them in the syllabus with a really cool name. Then when I get there, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have a lecture on this, but it's, it's my writing project. So then it forces me to come up with PowerPoint, package it, and deliver it. Um, I like those kind of deadlines where it forces me to actually package and deliver uh, certain kinds of material. Now let's say that your class is so busy you can't even fit that in, then here's what I do. Periodically, I take 15 minutes to present to the class questions uh, that you're wrestling with in your writing. So I will literally walk in my class. I think they really like this. I'll sit down and say, okay, close, close your laptops, put away your writing stuff. 15 minutes, and I, you got to help me with something. And then I'll say to them, I'm struggling with the virtue of open-mindedness. I would say that a key component for a good conversation is that you're open-minded heading into the conversation. Right? I mean, how would it play with my wife if heading in, we're going to talk about finances, but I said to her, but i got to tell you, and I pretty much know what we need to do. So let's have this conversation. You just need to know. I'm not really open to anything you have to say, but by golly, what do you got? Right? So then I say to them, but being a Christian problematizes that. So if I sit down with an atheist, and I'm saying to the atheist, hey, I really want you to consider having a paradigm shift and believing in God, but I'm not open to any of that. I said, would that be an authentic conversation? And all my students look at me and they go, no, no. I said, okay, how do we have authentic conversations about the existence of God uh, when we kind of have based our life on it? So talk to me, go. And it's really fun. And sometimes I'll, I'll write it down. Sometimes I ask a student to take notes for me for those 15 minutes or I record it. And I've gotten great material or sparked my thinking in certain ways, talking to students about my writing project. Even if it's totally unrelated to the class, I think students like being asked their opinion and having it be open-ended where they can contribute. Um, so let's talk about organization. Um, <clears throat> have you heard of Monroe's motivated sequence? Okay, Com Theory, Monroe's famous for this. Monroe's motivated sequence, uh, everybody who studies rhetoric and persuasion knows Monroe's motivated sequence is five steps. But Monroe would say, first two steps are, are the most important in my sequence. If you don't accomplish the first two, forget about it. You're done. It doesn't matter what you have. The first is you have to get people's attention. Right? I could say to you, uh, 3,000 kids die a day in Africa from malaria. Right? Well, you got my attention. OK, that's horrible. But I'm a college student. Okay, I've not made it a problem. I got their attention, but it's gone because I've not made it a problem. What editors want to see is why should I care about your topic? Why should your target audience care about your topic? And if you're writing about marriage, apologetics, um, rhetoric, what has not already been said for crying out loud when it comes to marriage? So what in the world do you have that gets my attention as an editor and you make me believe it's a problem that must be addressed? That to me is the key for writing and organizes everything. So being a counterpublic, uh, basically what I said in my book proposal, in 1960, Michel Foucault said that there's something called excluded discourse, that there are certain things you couldn't talk about in public. You'd be censored very quickly. He was a gay social critic in the 1960s, so he is envisioning his lifestyle being excluded discourse. Fast forward 50 years, and uh, the chief operating officer from Chick-fil-A is 
asked, are you a defender of traditional marriage? All he says is, guilty as charged. And now, his stores are being defaced with tastes like hate. People are boycotting Chick-fil-A. So today, we live in an age where the perception is some of our Christian beliefs are excluded discourse. We can't say that publicly. So how do we become effective counterpublics? Not that we just exist as a group by ourselves, but we actually want to engage people. How do you actually do that in an atmosphere of excluded discourse? And the university was like, got my eye, done. Got my attention. What do you got? So we got to get their attention to make this belief it's a problem, because so many things are coming past editors and journals. There has to be some unique twist to it. Um, <clears throat> I have a chapter file, so um, these are Manila uh, file folders that I have. My first chapter is what is a counterpublic? I'm going to explain this to people. Uh, then what is a Christian counterpublic? How is that different from being a counterpublic? Uh, and again, I always want to go through Monroe's motivated sequence. I want to get their attention at the beginning of the chapter and make them believe it's a problem. So for what is a Christian counterpublic, here's what I say. Being a Christian counterpublic is no fun whatsoever. Because I believe in a God who's powerful. I believe in a God who can work in the hearts of a king if he wanted to. So I'm out there slugging it along as a Christian representative. And not only are we getting killed, but non-Christian counterpublics for causes that I think run against the Bible are incredibly effective. So it's a bummer being a Christian counterpublic because I don't think any of my prayers are getting answered. I pray things get worse. This is like Psalm 73 every single day of my life. How can the wicked prosper when I'm fighting for a righteous cause and nothing's happening and everything's getting worse? Well, a regular counterpublic doesn't have to deal with that, but a Christian counterpublic has to deal with that. So again, I just want to problematize the chapter in such a way that I get their attention, and here's the problem that has to be addressed. That's why you need to read this chapter. Welcome to the argument culture. Um, we, Deborah Cannon, this is her phrase from Georgetown, she's a linguist. Uh, we, but we, we approach everything as if it's a verbal slug test. So as a Christian, how do I talk about really sensitive topics in such a way that I'm not in a verbal slug test? By the way, Bob back up to chapter 2. Peter says, when insulted, I want you to give a blessing instead. How am I supposed to do that? And then chapter four, the credibility of a counterpublic, your ethos is the most important thing. So again, these are my chap these are my file folders, and whenever I see something, I throw them into my file folders. So the whole Brian Williams thing has been gold for my chapter, right? 20 years in the business. And one thing gets questioned. One story gets questioned about his helicopter taking gunfire. Now somebody thinks, well, I'm going to tell you what, if he, lucked, if he wasn't quite truthful about that, could there be other things? Pretty soon, New Orleans is surfaced, where he says he saw dead bodies floating, and people are saying, listen, I knew where he was staying. There were no dead bodies floating. Right? So now it starts to unravel. So your credibility is being questioned. Well, I don't even know how I'm necessarily going to use that yet, but I start throwing it into my pot. So Bill O'Reilly steps up and says, you better believe Brian Williams should have been sure about what he was saying. It's the job of a national anchor to absolutely be sure. Mother Jones comes along and says, let's check Bill O'Reilly. And now they're questioning Bill O'Reilly, which adds to what Foucault would call an atmosphere of suspicion. Now I'm starting to fact check everybody. Is everybody um, exaggerating what you're saying or just flat out lying? And as Christians, how do we establish our credibility in an age where you can be fact checked? And second, how do we rise above that? So again, I'm just throwing stuff into my file folders, not even sure how I'm going to use it. Then I have one file folder that I call my junk drawer. This is, I just come across a great illustration. I have no idea how to use it. It doesn't fit anything, but it is just a killer um, illustration um, about a judge in Taiwan who this couple couldn't agree on how they were going to get a divorce. They couldn't agree on anything. So he literally ordered the court to cut the home in half, literally sever it in half. I have no idea what to do with that. that. That, to me, catches my attention. So I throw it in my junk drawer. And then when I get writer's block, I open up my pile of stuff and I just start reading it. Going, oh, that house thing. I still don't know how to use it. That's, that's still pretty cool. 
And then I'll come across things and I'll go, oh, this illustration, I need to use this. Um, I also begin a quote file. Um, every book I read, I force myself to come up with three quotes from the book. Now, I could get 30, but I'm not going to input 30. I'm, not, I'm never going to do that. So I force myself just to do three. And this quote file becomes a gold mine when I'm actually working on different projects. I, I've indexed it, only that I know where it starts start and stops. So one author starts here, but he stops here. I don't have quotes <coughs> categorized or anything like this. So a book I just read is Eugene Peterson taught Slant, his take on parables, where he says there's a lot more to speaking than getting the words right and pronouncing them correctly. Who we are and the way we speak make all the difference. I love this, but it is interesting and significant that Jesus doesn't use crisis language. He speaks conversation with hardly rise, raising his voice. Samaritans, then and now, have centuries of well-developed indifference, if not outright aversion to God language, at least the kind used by synagogue and church people. I just find those interesting, so I stick them in a quote file, a word document, and right now, by the way, I've asked my, I have a TA. I don't usually get TAs. And so one of her jobs right now is I have two books. And I've highlighted the ones I want her to do. And now she's in putting it into a profile. And uh, then I also have an illustration file uh, I keep. So here, uh, this was interesting from the Super Bowl. Remember when the Seattle uh, Seahawks, they won that game that they never should have won against the Green Bay Packers. And they showed Brian. Uh, Wilson, I think his first name. David Wilson? Russell. Russell Wilson. Well, they kind of compared it a little bit to the civil rights movement that he over, overcame that really hard thing. Well, it got a lot of backlash, saying, how dare you compare a football game to the civil rights movement? So the Seattle Seahawks actually had to officially respond, and this is what they said. We apologize for poor judgment. Shown in the tweet earlier sent, we did not intend to compare football to the civil rights legacy of Dr. King. So I'm using that as an illustration to say, there's sacred territory with everybody's community. You better not violate it. You better know ahead of time, this is what this community holds sacred. Do not violate it. And we need to know that before we start speaking to another community that you can't trespass on this sacred core belief. OK, so that's all my preparation to write. Now it's time for me to actually write. And I don't put it off because we're, I'm keen at putting it off. Uh, so starting to write is I use a writing schedule. Uh, the secret is the regularity, not the number of days or the number of hours. You want to consistently write every single week. I, it could be one day, two days, three days. That's it. But if you do it consistently, so what is saying, you're going to be much further than if you have a binge mentality of writing. You must ruthlessly defend your writing time. Remember, you're allocating time to write, not finding time. So here's my book. Here's my schedule. Monday from 8 to 8.50, I write. I sit down with my computer open. Uh, Jeremy's off to school. No rings left. And I have this little block, 8 to 8.50, and I write. I open that thing up, and I just start letting my hands go free and writing on my current writing topic. Tuesday is 8 to 9.15. You'll notice it extends the 50 minutes because studies have been shown that the second day of writing in a week is more productive than the first day. The first day, you've kind of gotten the bugs out a little bit. The second day is always more productive. So I give myself from 8 to 9, 15. Thursday, I'm back to my 50 minutes. Friday is 10 to 10, 15. That's a research day. The goal of Friday is to be ready to write on Monday. Now, some might look at that and say, 50 minutes? That's it? What, what can you do in 50 minutes? A lot more than you can do in zero minutes. <laughs> By the way, the secret of this method is you can do more than 50. You never do less than 50. So again, I can set that at 30. I can say from 8 to 8.30, but I never write less than 30. I could go for two hours if I'm on a roll and I have the time, but you never do less than 30. So set that for whatever is workable. So I had a person in the Q&A time when I did this webinar said, well, I, I think maybe I've got like 20 minutes. Take it. Take 20 minutes. Write for 20 minutes. Do I feel like such a loser? No. 20 minutes is awesome. Find 20 minutes. 
So that's my schedule. I do it, I do it um, relentlessly. I did it this morning. I was working on a chapter. Uh, any questions about this real quick? This is the heart of Silva's book. And by the way, it doesn't have to be four days. It can be two days. What, but, but, the, but the issue is you always pull off what you have done. And by the way, it can change. It, it can change month to month. Um, but this is the heart of how it does to be a productive writer. So any questions about that kind of a writing schedule? Um, there are periods of interruptions. So yes. you have to plan, but there's something coming, and you must attend to it. So how do you catch up, or how do you? Well, I would say this. I would pick the time in which I'm fairly sure there's not going to be an interruption. Or there won't be an interruption. So I, my office is, would be a, not a good place to do this on campus. It just wouldn't work because I can't not respond to a student knocking on the door. So I either, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I either write at home um, when, when nobody's home, right? Jeremy's at school and my wife actually works at Biola. Okay, so I'm, I'm alone. I don't answer the phone. Noreen knows not to call. Um, Jeremy, you better have been expelled by school is why you're coming home. Right, so I, for me, I can protect that time and be reasonably assured. So I've got a lot of writers write late at night or early in the morning because that's when I can control it. <coughs> and by the way, let's say something does come up um, at Monday 8 to 8.50. I don't make it up. I just make sure Tuesday happens. Okay. I, I wouldn't add in another one. I, I would just say, well, that was a bummer. I got, who knew I was going to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? I was coming. Um, so, so that's my schedule, and I, well, I'm pretty ruthless. I don't miss it. I just don't miss it uh, as much as humanly possible. Um, yeah. Okay, this is all right. Well, mm -hmm. when do you do research? Here. Right. Each one of these could. Each one of these could be research. Okay, that's, that's that was my question. But I'm going to give. I'm going to address that in a second. But don't fall in love with research. See, research is, the, is to me, the self-talk. Um, let me give you an example. I'm writing a chapter for this four-volume thing on, it's really cool, four volumes on, let's take a look at theologians and philosophers from a communication standpoint. So I'm, I'm doing Peter Kraft, I'm a Catholic scholar, uh, and I could, I could work on that outline for a year. I could, I could research for a year. And, and to me, it's safe to research. It doesn't cost me anything. So here's what I would do. I'd research a little. Like, let's say you have the early years of Peter Kraft, right? So the early years, I've done my research, and now I'm going to move on to the middle years. I'd say stop right there and write the early years. Write it right now. Go. You had a great research day. Next day, write it up as if it's part of your manuscript. Does that make sense? Because I love research. And I'll do outlines and graphs and charts, and at the end of the day, I have nothing on a had nothing towards my manuscript. So fight against the love of research. Now, I start each session, so now my, my 50 minutes is actually 45 minutes. It's five minutes. Again, when you sit down and open that thing up and you're like, okay, it is 8 o'clock on a Monday and let's go. Coffee? No, it is hot. Shoot. Um, here's what I do. I open that thing up, and I go for five minutes. I say, okay, uh, Peter Kraft's early years. I had an interesting relationship with his father. I wonder how that impacted his thoughts about writing. On one hand, he admired, I go for five minutes. I, I get my hands going. I prime the pump, and now I'm going. And I might stop and look at that and say, that was all garbage. Done. Now I start writing. I just want to, I, I want to start writing. So I'll just say, hey, um, why did I even pick Peter Kraft? Because he's a writer. I just want to start rapid writing. Go. Uh, Virginia Woolf believed writing at a gallop leaves one's internal critics behind. Again, I'm learning to turn off the judge is what I'm doing by my rapid writing. Uh, learn to accept imperfect thoughts on paper. But I want to have those thoughts on paper. I don't want to work it out just in my mind. I want to actually write and work it out. Um, 
So five minutes rapid writing. Uh, every day I start with this five minutes. Um, all right, now this is this is probably so quirky, no one's gonna think this is a good idea but me. I use a writing prompt. So I have an iTunes file that is solely used for writing. And my first song is Steve Winwood's song, Fly. And at the 50 minute mark comes Kim Waters' Step in the Name of Love. It's a saxophone uh, jazz number. So when I sit down to write, I immediately go to my file. I hit Steve Winwood, and it's like Pavlov's dog for me. I, I don't use that file for anything else but writing. So when I hit Steve Winwood, it's time to go, baby. And I just start going, because Steve Winwood's going, and I'm going with him. When, when Kim Waters comes, I go, wow, 50 minutes already? You know what? I actually do have an extra half hour. I just keep going. That's awesome. And then, by the way, after that 15-minute mark, I can stop anytime I want to, because I'm done. I completed my 50 minutes. I, I go to the International Coffee House in Brea. The only reason I go there is to write. I, I don't use it for anything else but writing. And by the way, let me just, what's your name again? Musa. Musa. I can go there, put my headphones on, and just write, and order my cup of coffee, sit down, and no one's going to bug me, except black people. From the church I was the intro teaching pastor at. Very, very <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I'm just wondering, okay, excuse me, I'm listening to Kim Waters right now. I can't talk. But, you know, so I find a place that... Relatively, I'm not going to be bothered. And now they know this is my writing spot. <laughs> so I, I get a cup of coffee, I absolutely buy a cup of coffee, and I sit down and I just start, I just start writing, I don't talk to anybody. And then I can kind of get out of there. Um, I use that as a prompt as well. Um, so by prompt, that's not actually write about what you did yesterday, or write about something that you, your favorite birthday party, or No, it's a talk. psychological prompt, yeah. Now, here's the best piece of writing advice I've ever received in my lifetime. This comes from a friend of mine, Tim Downs, who's a writer. This is what he says. When the time is up, and at a place where you know exactly what you will write the next time you sit down for your allotted time to write. Here's what most of us do. So I'm writing about Peter Kraft, and I'm, oh, and yeah, I'm going to use the intellectual's error. I think, yeah, yeah, because I think, so I'm going to gut it out. I'm going to do the intellectual's error, but guess what? After that, I'm not so sure where I'm going. So what I do is I stop. I said, no, 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 I'm going to do the intellectual's error because I know exactly where, where I kind of want to go with that, and I'm going to save it for my next time. Otherwise, if I use it up, I open it up on Thursday, and I'm looking at a blank screen going, oh, nuts, I don't know. So it's back to research. So I, I always lead myself where I know exactly the illustration I'm going to work on, what I'm going to work on, every single time I stop. Don't you leave yourself in a spot where you don't know what's coming next. Oh, when I did the webinar, uh, how does the digital divide impact our concept of the modern public square? I actually have some thoughts on that. So I left it there, because I think I know where I'm going. Friday is my big research day. Because Friday, I'm researching enough that on Monday, I know exactly where to start. So my 50 minutes on Friday is me playing around with my outline. I do have an outline. I work off of playing around with it. Um, so Friday, it, the goal of Friday is I know on Monday where to go. Yeah? So if you're writing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and think, I know I read something. And I'll, I'll put the, I'll, if anything is in brackets in my writing, that's my go-to thing. Brackets, killer quote from Kierkegaard. And I sort of, sort of think I know what it is. My old habit was, well, I'm going to go find it. No, you're killing your 50 minutes. Put that in brackets, that's what I'll do on, my, on Friday. So I leave myself these notes everywhere um, to do. I do like to reward myself. Um, so if I keep to my writing schedule for a month or two weeks, if you're just starting a week, reward yourself mm -hmm. with a true reward. Some writers, I know Tim Downs does a certain number of words. Once he produces a certain number of words, he rewards himself. And make it a reward, okay? I love two things in life. I love going to a matinee by myself. I love sitting there all by myself. I, I, you know, my wife, 
She's a great godly woman, love her to death, speak at marriage conferences together, and uh, she, she's probably slightly offended. I love to sit by myself and reward myself. So I've not seen American Sniper yet, and do you want to go see it? This is Bruxy, these, uh, these waffle sandwiches, like made from Satan's den himself. I mean, horrible <laughs> for you. Horrible. I don't do that often, but I'll do it. I'll say, if I finish this chapter, I'm going to Bruxy. And I think I can finish it on Thursday. So now I'm motivated now. I want Bruxy. I actually will go to Bruxy. Now, I try to eat healthy. I really do. But man, I'll sit down at Bruxy and just like, just all over your face. I just love it. All right, writer's block, and then I just opened up for questions. We're done. So obviously, all of us have writer's block. There's a ton of writing and research on writer's block. So here's what I love to do, is work on two projects simultaneously. As I'm writing this book, Counter Publics, I'm also agreed to do a chapter for this thing I was telling you about with Peter Craft. So if I ever really, really, really get stuck, like I'm just done. It's like, OK, I've got chapter four. I have no idea what to do with chapter four. I'm kind of done tired of talking about Counter Publics. I'm going to go do my Craft chapter. So I'll bop over to Craft, and now my writing schedule is all Peter Craft, and I might do that for a week or two, and then I bop back to my main project, which is Counter Publics. By the way, if you really have writer's block, one writer suggested, take a book that you love uh, and just type it out word for word. Get used to typing really good stuff, right? So I'm reading a, a Mewon book. <laughs> But you know, a book that I really like how this guy writes, Peter Kraft is an awesome writer. So I literally would just, just write word for word and get used to writing good stuff and then maybe then I'll break it. Here's one that um, Google does as well as NASA. Studies are done, and if you watch stand up comedy, clean, which is hard to find, stand up comedy, it has been shown to break writer's block because. People associate things you normally would not associate with each other. That's what a good stand-up comic does. So remember Stephen Wright? Am I really dating myself? Okay, Stephen Wright. So listen, if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving definitely isn't for you. What's another word for the source? I love that. I'd kill for a Nobel Peace <laughs> I'm writing a book. I've got the page numbers done. <laughs> See? And when I was doing this webinar, I couldn't hear anybody. I am laughing my head off. Thank you. One, I hope people are listening. I have no idea if people are listening. Two, I, come on, you've got to think this is funny. Um, so I will, I will watch Stephen Wright. YouTube is great. You can punch up a bunch of comics and just watch them, and it kind of gets you to think about things. Last, thoughts from an editor. I called my editor at University Press. I've been very uh, impressed how easily accessible they are. So I said, hey, I'm doing this webinar. Can you, can you just, uh, some things you'd want writers to know? They talk about the benefits of co-writing if two people bring something different to the table. So I said, give me an example of that. He said, how about a specialist, a PhD, and a non-specialist coming together? Hey, how cool would that be for you guys to have somebody who teaches at a university and somebody from the mission field? Right now you've got the scholarly part. You've got an active uh, person in the field. A psychologist, well, well, let me say, the one that struck them was, Jake, my, my first book was called The God Conversation, which is a book on apologetics from a communication standpoint. So our pitch was take one of the leading apologists and stick a calm guy with them. And they're like, oh, I like that. I don't know if they would have been up for two apologists or two calm people, but they do like the um, diversity of things. And by the way, I like co-writing um, because now you have these hard deadlines. You're writing with a person, and you and that person says to you, "Hey, I really do need your draft for chapter three next month. I just need it." It's harder to say no to a person. Um, what is the editor looking for in your book? He would say, "I'm looking for two things." Uh, this surprised me. One is a letter of reference, but know what the letter of reference is doing. The letter of reference isn't about your expertise. They know that by looking at your a vita that you're going to attach, and it isn't your writing style. They will know in a heartbeat if you can write. They'll read your letter, it's called a query letter, and you submit one chapter of your choosing, actually two chapters of your choosing, 
I always pick the introduction because it, it allows me to establish the problem and then a chapter of my choosing. They know in the first page whether you can write or not. So what's the letter of reference? The letter of reference has to do with the second thing you're looking for, and that is your marketing page. You know that publishing is in really bad straits right now uh, because of self-publishing has really taken off. The vanity press isn't so vain anymore. Uh, so their letter of reference is to assure them you have the market you're claiming. So let me give you a for instance. So my pitch for I beg to differ and the God conversation was I speak for Biola's apologetics program. And they speak to thousands of people, right? Well, anybody can say that. So my letter of reference was from Craig Hazen saying, yeah, Neil Hoff really does speak with us, and we sell his books when he speaks. Family Life, right? We speak for Family Life Ministries. I can say I have that market, but the letter of reference is from Dennis Rennie saying, yeah, we do sell Neil Hoff books at these conferences. And by the way, we run about 250,000 a year, people at our conferences. Awesome. You have a market. By the way, one question needs to be asked. If you really do have that kind of market, why not self-publish? If you really have access to a market like that, then why are you asking university to take 10%? And again, I'm a, I'm a low-level writer for university, you know, in the land of uh, John Stott, for crying out loud, right? I'm a low-level person. They're not putting a ton of money into advertising for me, right? So. Uh, if you really just want to get your thoughts out there, self-publishing has come such a long way, you might want to think about it. Now, in academia, we suffer because I don't think that applies to promotion. I don't think they would look at self-publishing and apply. But outside of that, man, the shack was turned down by everybody, and fine, he self-published. And a friend was so enamored by his sales that he started his own publishing company just to do the shack. So again, if it weren't for academia, we'd have a lot of freedom to do a lot of different things. And, and publishers know that. They know that there's some, been some very successful books out there that they just skirted the issue. And they just remember your completed manuscript that you're giving to them is really a first draft. So when I send this book in counterpublic to an university academic, they are going to in turn give it to an, another academic, a lay person, and a specialist of their choosing, and all three are going to read my manuscript and come back with suggestions. So the good thing about that is, my first manuscript, I, I can change things. I can change things even if those three didn't suggest it, I can still make changes. So once that comes back, I can change anything I want to, the university is fine with that, and then I send it back to them, their editor will look at that, and then guess what, it comes to me one more time, I can make more changes. So think of that completed manuscript as not your pristine dissertation that's not going to go in front of the committee. Your book is going to go to them, and you're going to still have chances to fix things. So again, don't think that, oh, this has to be perfect before I send it. No, they're going to make changes. And nobody's first copy, unless you're Rick Warren, is taken. Because Rick has the market, and they, they will cater to Rick no matter what. Right? So that's it. I don't know if any of that was helpful whatsoever, but thoughts, comments, um, how it strikes you. University would say we're still in a recession, so the numbers have changed. Mm -hmm. If you go academic, uh, the expectations are, are low. So let me say for university pre recession, if you did a popular book, they would be looking for roughly five to six thousand copies sold. Recession, which we're still in, now they, they would drop that down to roughly, uh, I think Al Sue said to me, three to four thousand. In a recession, IBT academic fifteen hundred. Because again, they want to make their money back. So fifteen hundred. At the same time, I think we can say that there are more options. For example, there are more journals that professors yes. can publish in. Yes. There are 
you know, I've seen some pretty, um, you know, obscure publishing houses for books too. So if we're doing it just because, you know, we need a promotion, we've got some good ideas, I don't think we should worry about, oh, I don't think 6,000 people are going to read this book. I think we should just get the book done. Well, think about your market, though. Your market is, I mean, you're, you're part of a well-known Christian university. Um, are there certain events your department can do to, to get you outside of even the, the uh, department? So again, a campus-wide event that you would host. I think university would look at that and say, OK, so it's not just your students. You actually have a chance to do something campus-wide. Uh, I think they would be very favorable towards something like that. But you have to show them, I can actually get to the 6,000. Now, that, that can be discouraging because a lot of people do not have access to 6,000 people. They just don't. But as a university, I think we can say that we you know, realistically have access to certain things. Why have you chosen to stick with um, I don't know. I don't know anything else. I have friends who are with Zondervan. I have friends with other places, and you learn what they do and don't do. The one good thing InterVarsity really does is they're really into radio interviews. So you hit a radio tour. Uh, for I bet to differ, I'm up to 40 radio interviews. Now you do them from your house, right? You walk around in your pajamas and do a radio interview. Uh, my friends at Zondervan say, what? What? I bet you I've done two. So I'm pleased with, with InterVarsity, because again, it costs them nothing to have two mil off book done. It doesn't cost them anything. And if anything, it gets InterVarsity's name out there. So I, I think my answer to that would be the radio interview thing as well. And again, I have access to the editors now. You want to protect those relationships. So Kitty, what I would suggest that you do, uh, and I found out about this late, but Talbot, Editors are always, publishers are always coming through Talbot. And I think it would be good to reach out to Talbot and just simply say, can I get in on the Matt publisher actually comes to Biola? I think that Matt also brings up another question. Because what if you honestly have no idea what to write? Because you're probably going to be asked to write a book. Some of us are in that situation. OK. I would, I would sit and have. Uh, brainstorming times together. And again, I work through Monroe's motivated sequence. What's the problem you want to address and why is it a problem? Kenny, if you just had that figured out, an editor would listen to that. An editor would say, okay, what do, what do you got? Well, did you know this is happening in the world today? Uh, I actually didn't. Or, yeah, I did. I'm aware of that. So what? Here's why it affects all of us. Good. You don't need to have anything but that. And now that editor has a name and a face. Um, I actually pitched, I beg to differ, to Kriegel. Uh, I had this idea of a, uh, of a book, Proverbs, let's have a communication model. I pitched it to, to Kriegel. It was pretty broad. And uh, Kriegel said, we're interested. Get us a query letter and uh, one chapter. But then JP. I was bossing an idea off of him for the guy conversation. He said, oh, let's do it. I, I was going to ask JP to co-write. I never would have done it. He said, let's do this together. And I was like, yes. So we did it together. So uh, you don't need much to sit with an editor to pique his or her. But if, if you're at that place where I don't know what to write, then I would sit down and brainstorm and say, hey, let's do this. Let's come up with stuff. Um, yeah. The best press to approach is one in which you have a contact with, which is great because Biola is highly represented with all the publishers. I mean, we're everywhere. So my first answer to that question would be: I would go with the publisher that you can get to. Uh, Al Sue has said to me. Except for uh, vampire Christian love stories, I'm up for listening to whatever you have. So if somebody came to me with a really good idea, it's nothing for me to pass it along to Al Su. And say, hey, Al, I think this is a great professor at Biola. I don't know much about the topic, but it seems pretty compelling. I bet you'd want to have a first look at it. So I would go with the publisher that you feel like you can cultivate 
um, an inside look with. I would get their catalogs and look at what kind of stuff they're doing. Um, small publishers are, are good, but they're small, so they're not doing that many books in a year. Uh, InterVarsity is doing quite a bit, so the competition is going to be a little harder. But, but as my dissertation director said to me, the greatest gift God can give you is thick skin. So, uh, if, you know, we all have gotten rejection letters from journals. And my dissertation director would say, fine, you're part of the club. Awesome. Put that behind you and send it out again. So I, I would be proactive in sending out stuff. And there's writer's workshops that you can actually go to where they have special seminars on all of these topics. We always take advantage of uh, the writer's workshop that they do every January and June is they set up places for us to write. And I always sign up for one of those and go. Because it, it's accountability for me to sit and you start to have good relationships with people where you can bounce ideas off. But I would have, a, if I would be so bold to suggest, I would have a time for your department, your division, to come together and, and brainstorm ideas, book ideas, collaborative ideas as well, but just to say, hey, I've got this crazy idea, isn't any good? And sometimes that idea wasn't good, but it's, it's, it spins off to an idea that was really good. Like, that didn't so much work, but did you ever think about doing it this way? And you're like, oh, I didn't. That's really good. So I, I use resources that you have just to say, hey, let's talk and brainstorm. Inspiration. Oh. Well, speaking of inspiration, I have to tell you, when I listened to the webinar, the very next week, I'm out there with my three days a week writing schedule. You're doing it? And then I fell off the way. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, welcome. I mean, so, I so, all right. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, there has to be, and you, you know, you've probably done the research on developing a habit yes. and how much you have to yeah. invest to actually make it a habit. The self talk, you know, I'm halfway through a book and I'm filled with lots of negative yes. self talks. Yep. Yep. Can I just say two quick things? Yes. Just like any endeavor, having a partner makes all the difference whatsoever. So I would say, hey, who wants to try this next week? And say, we're going to do it for 21 days. What psychologists would say is roughly what it takes to start a habit. Then I would just partner up with somebody. There's at least accountability to say, hey, I did it. I, I did one whole week. Or I missed one day, but the rest was great. It's like, awesome, let's keep going. I, I would pair up if, if you can find people like that. Um, and then you are your own worst critic. We are, we are not good at self-assessment. We're really not. So you really do need to have somebody that you can hand them it, what you're writing, and let them comment into it. Because our self-talk is so negative. But let people comment on it, the good and the bad. You know, hey, I thought this was great. It's not quite there yet, but um, you know the issue of I mean, uh, issue of accountability. I mean, after uh, listening to your webinar, I also I mean, the writing project, working on, but I went on days. I think I did probably three days or four. I mean, I was going, but uh, then I fell off, as you said, and all of a sudden, I mean, negative self-talk, yeah. of course, I mean, was there. So that was one thing I really appreciated from your um, webinar. Uh, but accountability was what I thought would probably have helped me if I had done that at the beginning. Yeah. But one thing you said uh, at the webinar that I think is very important is uh, you advised that uh, if you're going to begin something like this, it may be helpful to even begin with prayer and oh, fasting. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you said was that uh, look, writing is not just for writing's sake, it's getting your ideas there, and those ideas are going to impact and influence a lot of people. And sometimes, to be honest, uh, the evil world wouldn't want those ideas to come out because it's going to have kingdom uh, impact and uh, because of that you better be sure, uh, you better know that uh, there's going to be that opposition, spiritual uh, opposition. So I really appreciate it because I've never thought of writing as a spiritual endeavor. I mean, uh, but that was very good. 
So half of my books have been co-written. Uh, I love the process. I love the company. Writing can be lonely. It really can be a lonely endeavor. Um, so I really very much enjoy having a person that is built in accountability because we're co-writing it together. Uh, I enjoy that process. And the university's not balked at it. They not looked at it and said, no, we don't want you co-writing. I don't think they have a, a, an issue with it. It can actually be a huge plus because now you've got two markets coming together if you think of it that way, um, which, which could be attractive to them. Yeah. yeah, I co-authored my first book two or three years ago with Gary McIntosh. Who's written 20 books, right? Yeah. So he used his leverage to get us a contract. Yeah. And then it was that accountability. I didn't want to let Gary down that kept me writing. So I mean, that was a great launch into that. And JP was my co counsel in University. Yeah. Yeah. So very generous. What's a special appreciation for Tim? Yeah, Sure, I'll see you